Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi, we are going to talk to a wonderful expert today about the problems of lost cancer. And uh, I want to get right to it because she's got so much information. Do you want to introduce her, Heidi? Sure, I'd love to. We are going to talk today with Dr. Wendy Lichtenthal. And Wendy has been a guest on our show before, and she's also been on our cable show. So if you want to go in and see what she's done, please do, because she is really one of the leading experts in the country on finding hope after loss and making meaning out of your losses. And Wendy is the director of the Bereavement Clinic and an associate attending psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center here in New York City. Her clinical practice and research focuses on supporting bereaved individuals and helping them find meaning in their lives and in their loss. Welcome to the show, Wendy. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be with you. It's wonderful to be on. Well, let's get right to it because there's so many people who've lost family members to cancer. And are there some you know, compelling things that are different about a cancer loss? Absolutely. Um, I think you know, there's, there are a few different things to keep in mind after losing someone to cancer. <clears throat> One is that in so many cases, the individual has been part of the, the person they've, they've lost cancer journey. Um, in many cases, a caregiver, a primary caregiver. And that role of caregiver um, comes with a lot of different things. One is certainly a sense of responsibility. Um, and so we often see that individuals who have been in that caregiver role or contributed to treatment decision-making struggle with thinking back and wondering what if, what if we had taken a different path or what, if, you know, how did I handle a given situation? And so it's common for those individuals to experience guilt um, as they reflect on that. Um, we say that that is kind of part and parcel of the, the, the um, journey of being a caregiver is that that guilt is common. It doesn't reflect that you engaged in a wrongdoing. It doesn't mean that something happened or that you made a wrong decision, but more that this is kind of what it is to be a caregiver. You're always thinking about what else could I have done? My cousin's daughter had Hodgkinson's disease and the g guilt, about not catching it too early, you know, not mm -hmm. seeing it, not knowing, not getting them in, not doing that kind of treatment is pretty profound. It really is. And it's whether it's a child who's a dependent or an adult child. I work with so many individuals where, you know, they, they feel like they should have said something or pushed more um, or pushed for a different, a second opinion. All of those reflections that of course, reflect just wishing this all never happened, but that people who care the most kind of take ownership of. So it's really common to feel like I should have done something differently. Maybe I could have um, played a role in preventing this or getting someone in sooner. Um, and so we really want to build up for those grieving individuals who struggle with that, a sense of compassion to pull themselves and think about what they would tell someone else that they care about if they had heard this, heard this story, right. that, you know, we always have that hindsight bias. We look back and think, what if? I, I'm just wondering, you were talking about guilt, and I'm wondering if there's also a sense of guilt if you've seen someone suffering and you've been taking care of them for a long time, and there, if there's a sense of relief after they die, if yeah. that happens, and if so, I would imagine that would bring about a lot of guilt in people. Yes, exactly. That was going to be the next kind of common okay. mix that I was going to mention that is so common after a cancer loss is that when you've witnessed someone struggling and suffering, um, it is normal to feel a sense of relief after they die, that they're no longer in that state of suffering. Mm -hmm. And then as you say, Heidi, to then feel on top of that, wait, now I feel badly that I'm carrying this relief. And, and I've so also lot lost, people, kind of lost my job too, if it's a long-term cancer. I mean, you oh, lost absolutely. your purpose. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So there, there's this such a mix. And so I think to that, we often talk about 
this being an and experience, you can feel profound grief and sadness and feel relief. You can, we can feel more than one thing at the same time. And so we talk to people about being able to hold multiple states of emotion um, and one of them being certainly relief uh, after witnessing someone suffering. Um, it's also common to have that replay, the, the, the visuals, the imagery of someone suffering, mm -hmm. um, and to have that be really disturbing for, of course, um, to, to have that replay over and over again. We want to always think about whether that going through someone's mind is so disruptive that it feels like a, a trauma reaction. I was um, just thinking that. I just, I just wrote up, I just was interviewed for a piece on trauma. Yeah. in everyday health yesterday and it what you're saying reminds me of traumatic loss and sometimes right. we don't think about traumatic loss when we think about cancer death exactly. but like you said there can be a trauma piece to this it's it's in the the eye of the experiencer right it's the perception mm -hmm. of the individual who lost that person so it depends on what you as an individual witnessed um, and what that the meaning of that was to you you know for some people i, I worked with someone um, a long time ago who themselves had panic attacks. And when they had panic attacks, they felt like they were choking. And that was the most awful feeling one could experience. And their loved one at the end of their life was, was gasping and choking. And for that person, that was just the hardest thing to witness and to imagine their loved one struggling with. So it really is about what the individual perceives as traumatic that would would speak to a, a traumatic stress response. So I think, you know, we're talking about so many different things right now that maybe people don't think about typically when they think about a cancer loss, but um, but certainly to witness suffering like that can lead to, to trauma-related symptoms. That doesn't mean someone necessarily has full PTSD, a post-traumatic stress disorder, but that they could relive those moments is very common and it would be natural to to have that come back to the mind especially when certain reminders present so so much of what we do after cancer loss is normalizing how hard it is and how many of these symptoms come up for people mm -hmm. so uh, let's also talk a little bit about couples um, and particularly uh, after a child dies um, what about those relationships? Because sometimes I've seen uh, that one caregiver, particularly it seems like women sometimes don't, there's no space for the man there to be on that level. So it's difficult later on, they weren't exactly together on it. Do you see that? I, we see such a mix of different kinds of ways of approaching the caregiving and, and of course their grief. Um, for the caregiving, you know, there's certainly, um, tends to be someone who does more of the hands-on work, though not always, but certainly with, with um, families, one parent kind of being more at the bedside and doing more of the, the, the medical caregiving and the other one caregiving in all these other ways. So we talk about the fact that how whatever role of a given parent might have played, even if it wasn't at the bedside, they were taking care of the family in other ways. Yes, often it is, you know, the, the mom who is um, at the front lines in that way, but not always. Um, and so certainly I've worked with moms where they weren't at the bedside in the same way and then feeling guilt for not for not playing that particular role. Um, I think that we um, in grief know that couples often grieve differently. And so that holds true for a cancer loss or otherwise this idea that um, someone might be replaying those moments, really suffering with grief more um, or guilt. The other parent might be um, trying to kind of uh, hold the family in a different way and not be holding the, their grief in the same way. And then friction when they're not on the same page and what they need. But I've also seen couples come together and have their um, kind of regulate each other and be there understanding when one needs more time and space to be with their grief. Um, the other one kind of stepping forward and, and helping and taking care of the family. So I think, I think what we want to acknowledge is that there are all sorts of reactions, many of them common, so that in a given couple, if they are struggling and coming together in their grief, that they don't pathologize that, that they don't think there's something wrong with them as a couple. Um, for those who are on different pages, 
um, getting more support might be might be something to help them be compassionate to one another's reactions. Now, now I want to ask you, you said the big word support. I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, wow, I wish she were at my house. I wish she were there helping me because I'm hearing a lot of things that I'm feeling after a loss to cancer. And what would you suggest that I do? How do I reach out and 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 how do I get started if I'm feeling in a dark place? Yeah, I mean, I think um, finding finding therapists or counselors who specialize in grief is something that someone can do, not only because it's not necessarily the case that someone is um, not coping adaptively. Sometimes it's just to get that that education, that that normalization, that validation for what they are experiencing and permission to feel that way. So sometimes just consulting with a professional to share more about what you're experiencing and to hear back, yes, of course you are, can be helpful in and of itself. For others who are having more struggles in terms of being able to function and take care of things, um, really just feeling intensely distraught, um, reaching out and looking for grief specialists can be something that, that we would absolutely recommend in the community. Um, so individual support is one pathway, um, as is looking for group support. Um, mm -hmm. Not everybody loves groups, but a lot of times that same kind of normalization and validation I'm speaking about, there's no therapist or counselor who can who can tell you to be grieving differently or that you should be um, coping differently. It's more that being around others who are struggling as you are can give you um, that sense of validation. Um, and that can be the, the most helpful thing that people describe. And, and Wendy, I think there's a myth out there that people that have had a loss that they expected due to a terminal illness have, it, have an easier road to recovery and finding hope than people that have a sudden death. I'm so glad you raised that. I think that um, that the individuals themselves sometimes are surprised about the intensity of their grief because there was some way that they felt like they may have been preparing for it. But so many people I work with um, will say maybe intellectually they had some, they understood what was going on, but emotionally, they held hope and of course they did. And so they're in this position where they feel absolutely still blindsided. Um, so it could be that blindsided effect, but also we know that grief is about the relationship. And, and so it doesn't, the cause of death, while it plays a role in how someone might be thinking about and experiencing their grief, it doesn't change the how profound missing and yearning and wishing for that person may be. So regardless of the cause of death, the power and the intensity can be enormous. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a really important point you're raising that people shouldn't, um, they should give themselves permission to feel whatever they're feeling. It's about the relationship, not about the cause. But there are these things that we know are added layers of struggle because of what they witnessed, because of the role they played in caregiving, um, because of you know that what you raised, Gloria, about you know wishing that a diagnosis had been made sooner and what if, what if, all of that that comes into play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, tell us uh, how people can get a hold of you and what you're doing and uh, any recommendations you have for them. Absolutely. Well, as a, um, a lot of our work focuses on finding meaning uh, in life after loss, we think about ways to coexist with grief because it's not about, you know, trying to resolve grief or get rid of grief, but to figure out how to live alongside grief. And so we do that through thinking about how to find meaning in life. Um, so often this comes from drawing on what you witnessed in your loved one who went through cancer and tapping into that connection and tapping into how they coped with their own suffering to use as you as you face each day in your suffering. For more information um, in general on grief and loss, um, you're welcome to, um, if you just Google um, my name, we have lots of things that we've written um, on how to cope with loss. Um, and so our writings, um, we have chapters and books, we're happy to share um, any resources that individuals might find helpful um, that speak to finding meaning in life after loss. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for being on the show and for everything you do. You're an amazing woman. Oh, thank you for having me. And thank you for what you are offering hope for everyone as they, as they live with their grief. Appreciate it. Wendy, thank you so much. I mean, you're doing groundbreaking research 
on finding hope after loss and meaning making. And thanks everybody for listening and watching our show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.